Thank you very much, Mike, and thanks for leaving me at least five or ten minutes to talk. That was <laughs> sweet of you. Mike actually wrote me several emails asking if I could help come up with an introduction, and he kept pushing me, don't you have any Irish in you somewhere? <laughs> it's a huge failing, but I'm sorry, no Irish whatsoever. <laughs> so thank you very much. I want to thank Mark uh, for inviting me. I'm obviously not a bioscientist. I'm a chemist. But I have a lot of friends in biology. I do a lot with people in biology. And this story really starts um, 15 years ago in 2002. I turned uh, 55 years old. And my wife, Alice, came up to me and said, so what are you going to do for the rest of your life? More of the same? And I said, well, shit, until a minute ago, it didn't sound like such a bad idea. But <laughs> maybe I better think about it. And I really did. I sat back and said, you know, at 55, if God's good and you're lucky, you might have another 5, 10, maybe 15 years where the brain still works and the body works most of the time. So what would I want to leave behind as you leave this good earth? I could do more synthesis. I was a pretty good synthetic chemist. That would have been fine. But I actually wanted to do something more. So I took that challenge seriously. And I decided I wanted to change everything I was doing and start something brand new. I wanted to change my lab from synthesis to medicinal chemistry drug discovery because I wanted to try to get a drug for some human disease out of my lab at UCLA. Now, that's a hell of a ridiculous, lofty goal because you can work 40 years in pharma, have all of pharma behind you, and still not get a drug. It's hard. It's hard to get a drug on the market. But I figured, hell, if it's your last goal in life, it might as well be a big goal, right? And I figured even if I failed miserably and nothing ever happened, people would just think, oh, Jung, he retired early. You know, so <laughs> what the hell? Now, that was fine. It was a good decision. But of course, I'd never done medicinal chemistry or drug discovery. So you know, how do you get started? I, you know, I didn't know what to do. But I'd consulted in the pharma industry for, at that point, about 20 years, now 35 years. And even if just by osmosis you pick up some ideas of how to make drugs work and what are good and what are bad in drugs. So I decided, hell with it. I tried to wing it. So, so I decided, OK, here's a decision. Let's get started. But in order to get started, you need money. Because nobody knew me as a medicinal chemist. How am I going to get funds to hire postdocs to do all of this? So I decided I would go to the three most prominent people I knew in the med school. Mike Phelps, Owen Witte, and I don't know where Lenny Rome is. but. I went to them. We had a meeting in, in uh, Lenny's office. And I told them, I want to set up a drug discovery program at UCLA, a little UCLA Pharma, I called it. I'm going to run it, and you're going to pay for it. <laughs> and I got, <laughs> how much? And I said, 60K. 60K total? Yeah. Oh, shit, write him a check. So, <laughs> so Owen and Mike and Lenny funded me for the first three years. And since then, for the last 12 years, I've managed to find money on my own so that we have money that allows us to do this sort of chemistry. And I'm going to say, even before starting, to show you what I've done, that I think this has been an incredible success. And that 60K that these guys put on the line for me has been fabulous. Because I'd say a third of the people in the audience I'm collaborating with or have collaborated with and you may not believe me, but oops, I've got to turn this on. But here are the collaborations that I have ongoing today in my lab. So there's some which are getting started. In fact, there are probably three or four more names that haven't made it left. But people like Mike and Owen, we've collaborated in various ways over the years. And these are all of the folks, as I say, a lot of you are sitting in the audience. So I hope I haven't missed many names. But. Uh, and here are the past collaborations. So over the last, this is over the last 10 years, the people with whom I've worked and published papers, written grants, gotten grant support. So if, if the whole idea of this program was to somehow get chemistry and biology together in a really tight way, I think it's been a huge success. And I've enjoyed the hell out of it. And I'm going to show you one or two of the successful parts. And I'll start with one. Most of you know this guy. This is Charles Sawyers, who was here for many years uh, and is now at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And in 2002, he came to me, and he wanted me to do some chemistry for him. And he wrote out what he wanted. And it was a 
terribly stupid idea. And I said, Charles, we, you know, we can make that compound, but it's not going to work. He says, Mike, I said, Charles, it's not going to Mike, I said, OK, we made the compound. So the compound was an alkylating agent. We were alkylating the AR. And it did alkylate the AR, and it killed the AR, but it killed everything else in the body, too. It was not a great compound. And I said, look, let's get some money, and we'll actually do this right. And through Owen's help, we were able to write for a prostate cancer foundation in those days called CapCure Grant and got started. And this is what um, Charles Sawyers wanted to do. He wanted to stop prostate cancer. Came into my office, let's stop prostate cancer. It's a great idea. And I knew, you know, very little about prostate cancer. Okay, it hits men. We're the only ones with prostates. Uh, it's a bad disease, but not the worst disease in the world. You know, in 2016, an estimated 180,000, 26,000 deaths. Now, 26,000, that's a lot of men that are losing their lives. But that means 150,000 are not dying of the disease. So this is not a death warrant if you get prostate cancer. Worldwide, this is now, they claim, up to about 2 million cases and about 400,000 deaths. So prostate cancer is a disease. Oh, I should tell the men in the audience, guys, you've got one of two choices. You either die or you get prostate cancer. <laughs> That's it. 70% of the men over 70, 80% of the men over 80 get prostate cancer. But usually, prostate cancer starts off as a manageable disease. It usually starts slowly. It's not very aggressive, not very metastatic. And the treatment is usually what used to be called watchful waiting, in quotes. Today, we, we call it active surveillance, which sounds more exciting somehow. But all you do is you watch the PSA level go up. And as long as it goes up very slowly, you do nothing. You don't treat the disease. You'll die with the disease, not from the disease. And so, in general, it's untreated. And that's why you know, 150,000 men live with the disease without a problem. The second type of prostate cancer is very active, very metastatic, very aggressive, a very bad disease. It kills men in their 40s and 50s. It's a bad disease. And the treatment usually starts with radiation, because you want to retain sexual function. If that doesn't work, you can do prostatectomy, take the prostate out. If that doesn't work, what it generally is done is chemical or physical castration, and that shoots the cancer down. Because the cancer is dependent on androgen binding to the androgen receptor. So that, in general, if you look at tumor growth by PSA, you use drugs that uh, do a chemical castration, anti-androgen treatment, and the cancer shoots down. And 30 years ago, those were the only types of cancer there were, prostate cancer. But then we started seeing a third form of prostate cancer come up. And it was originally called uh, androgen independent. And then we called it hormone refractory for a number of years. The proper name today is castration resistant. It's resistant to all the current drugs. And in fact, this period from knocking it down to death is two to four years in most men. And so. And the, the question is, what can we do to stop this? What is going on, and how do you stop it? And so Sawyers, obviously an incredibly bright biologist, wanted to know what, what is the change, the biological change that takes you from being able to treat a drug, treat a, a disease with a drug, a hormone, to something that is hormone insensitive. So, and so he, we had seven patients at UCLA Hospital. He looked at them and did what biologists do, microarrays of this and that, and found one protein upregulated. Oh, I should point out, this relapse is 100%. Every man who has the cancer shoot down relapses and goes to the castration-resistant disease. So he did a, a study and looked at all of these uh, proteins and found one protein upregulated in all of the cases we had, and that was the androgen receptor. And I think we should have guessed that from the beginning. You know, cancer cells have one purpose in life, to grow. And if you block them growing, they figure out ways around that blockage. And so castration removes the testosterone. And you need testosterone binding to the AR. So what the cancer cells do is upregulate the AR so that the small amount of androgen you have. By the way, I think that's the earliest I've ever had somebody leave one of my talks. This is really exciting. This <laughs> What is it, 12 minutes? Wow. <laughs> he only came from Mike's introduction. Anyway, <clears throat> so, so um, they upregulate the receptor five-fold in the cancer cells so that a very low level of testosterone still sends a downstream message to grow cancer. 
And even in castrate men, there's a low level of testosterone because it's, in women, there's a low level of testosterone because it's made in the adrenal glands as well as the testes. So this low level, basal level of testosterone is there. The cancer cells upregulate the receptor to that level now sends the message to grow cancer again. So when we heard this, this was the good news, bad news uh, deal. The good news is this is still a treatable disease. It still depends on some androgen binding to the AR. And so therefore, we can treat it. We can figure out how to beat this disease. The bad news is we have to find a better androgen receptor antagonist than anyone has found in the 40 years that Big Pharma has been working on this. And that's a daunting task. How are you going to do that? But it's a challenge, right? This is what we're here for. So this is something Charles, obviously all the biology in this talk comes from Charles and his group. So to show that the AR is both necessary and sufficient, if you look at tumor volume going up, and the vector, it goes up, but if you throw in a piece of siRNA that hits the AR, the cancer stops, so it is necessary for growth. It is also sufficient, so in intact males, you get cancer growth. In castrate males, you don't, but if you add exogenously AR back, you get the cancer to grow. So necessary and sufficient. So this is what I show my students, what I tell them. What do you do now? You know, now you know the problem, but what the hell do you do? Where do you get started? That's the simple thing. I tell people like Jennifer, one day you're going to go to work in, in an industry somewhere, and some, your boss is going to come in and sit you down and say, OK, I want you to solve Newman-Picks disease. And you're going to say, yes, sir. And like, what the hell is Newman-Picks disease? You know, you've got to get started somewhere. And the way we decided to get started, we did one big screen. We're, you know, both, most big pharma companies would do a huge screen. Merck has six million compounds in their database, and they try to find some. We don't have six million compounds. We don't have the, the manpower of Merck. So I decided what we wanted to do was to get something that had extremely good binding affinity, know that we at least had a good binder, and then see if we could change the usually an agonist property to an antagonist. So this paper was published in 1994 in, uh, by the people at Roussel Ucloff in France, a uh, chemical company. By the way, I always say this is UCLA in France, so it's not exactly that. But uh, And what they did was to set testosterone artificially to 100. Dihydrotestosterone, another natural ligand, less important because there's less of it than testosterone. It binds about twice as good. R1881 is about three times as good, but so we could have started here. But this is a chemically very unstable molecule. It would be very hard to make analogs of that that look like they would work. In fact, in this paper, the strongest binding compound was a compound Roussel Ucloff had made years before, 59063. It's this compound, and it bound three times better than testosterone, a very, very tight binding to the AR. And you could even see there was already a little bit of an SAR, a structure activity relationship, just in this paper. Because if you take uh, 59063, it has four carbons and an OH. If you lose two of the carbons, you lose about 50% binding. And if you lose the OH completely, you lose about two thirds binding. So that tells you that this part of the molecule is somehow important for binding. Sorry, Mike, standing in your way. Somehow this is important for binding. And um, so we thought, well, we could start with this and see if we could monkey around with the structure and come up with something that might be good. I wanted to put these compounds up. Bicolutamid or Casodex is the drug that's used probably the most often in early prostate cancer. Hydroxyflutamid and nilutamid are two other compounds that are used. And look at their binding numbers. They don't bind worth a damn. You know, here's testosterone, 100. They're, they're like 100 times less active than testosterone in binding. And they've got to compete away natural testosterone when they're given. This is a horrible idea. We, we need something that binds a lot better than that in order to win the game. So we decided, OK, we're going to start here with 59063 and see what we can do. We needed to test for both antagonism and agonism. The antagonist test is fairly easy. We did four different tests. We take the natural promoter for probation of the rat prostate tie, some androgen respect, uh, uh, androgen receptor elements to it and have a luciferase readout. 
And you get things that look like this, where the, the drug on higher doses knocks down the cancer. We can also take just a piece, an artificial promoter piece of DNA, and put in some antigen response elements, again, with a luciferase readout. This is clean as a whistle, but not physiologic. This is physiologic, but dirty. Uh, you can do PSA expression, measure the PSA expression, and you can do the old mitochondrial stain cell counts. So there's four different ways to measure whether you're antagonizing the tumor or not. So that was easy. For the agonism, what we wanted to do was to grow the cancer cells that were hormone refractory and see whether we worked against them. It turns out we couldn't. And I didn't know anything about chemists, right? So I don't know biology at all. But I had to talk to my biology friends. It turns out prostate cancer cell lines are very hard to grow in culture. Why? I don't know. But Sawyers and his group, who are good guys, couldn't grow these prostate cancer cells, the hormone refractory cells in culture. So we were stuck. What did we do? We cheated. And the way we cheated was to make cells, our own cell line, LANCAP AR cells, <clears throat> by taking a full length uh, cyclic DNA that encoded for the AR and infecting these cells so that they overproduce the AR. So all we got out of this was a normal prostate cancer cell line. LANCAP was a good growing cell line, but with high expression of AR, three or five fold more AR. We hoped that would mimic what we'd see in the clinic, but there was no guarantee that would be the case. But it was the best way we had of testing in the disease model that we wanted to look at. Okay, so this is the whole talk in one slide. So we, we looked at crystal structures. There's crystal structures of the AR, but only with uh, agonists, not with antagonists. You can pull the agonists out, put your molecule in, let it relax and get some idea. But we didn't really learn a lot from that. We did homology modeling. I wasted two years of a good grad student doing that. We learned nothing predictive. We learned after the fact we could say why something worked and didn't work but we learned nothing new there. And then I showed you the slide on binding affinity. So we decided to start with this compound, 59063. It's about five nanomolar, so a very strong binder, but a strong agonist. So when you add it to cancer, the cancer grows faster. And we weren't smart. We were just, you know, persnickety. We just went after it. We knew that there were water molecules, obligatory water molecules in the crystal structure to an arginine. So we tried to replace those water molecules by making this group larger. Those failed miserably. The only thing that worked here was nitrile or nitro at that position. Nitro is not the best. We needed a hydrophobe here. We tried a few different things. Iodide worked pretty well, but trifluoromethyl was best. We couldn't put anything at those two carbons. They screwed up the binding. I caught an enormous amount of grief for having this C double bond S in a molecule. That's called a thione. And every medicinal chemist in the world said, oh, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be awful. I said, hey, wait, man. It's a thiourea. Come on. That's going to be stable. It's going to no, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be awful. So, uh, <laughs> so I said, the hell with them. We put an oxygen there. And it worked, but it was about four times less active. We put S on the top, S on the bottom, O on the top, O on the bottom, O here, S. All of them, and of all of them, S on top, O on bottom just bound the best. So the hell with what current wisdom said, we went with that. And the yellow and blue, those were binding affinity. No matter whether you're an agonist or an antagonist, if you don't bind, you're dead in the water, right? You've got to bind to get anything to work. So then we went to the red spot. We started with dimethyl. We could do almost anything here. Cyclopropyl was hard to make, cyclobutyl, cyclopentyl, they all worked. Dimethyl, diethyl. We could do a lot of things here and get good active compounds. We couldn't get H here, which was somewhat surprising. Uh, it probably enolizes in cells and no longer binds. But nonetheless, this is the first time we started seeing some interactions that might give us antagonists versus agonists. And then we took this flexible side chain and made it a rigid side chain. That was very early on. And bam, as Emerald used to say, bam, that did it. It just was a pure antagonist. We made this one minor change, and that changed everything. It would be very nice to be able to explain why that did what it did. We still don't know, but the best picture is this. The AR is a 12 helix bundle. Helix 12 opens up, testosterone comes in, folds down, sends message to grow cancer. Uh, RU59063 goes in, it's got a flexible chain, the chain wiggles around, it folds over, downstream message. 
We believe that our compound, because of this rigidness, when it comes in, it actually physically hits. It sort of blocks it at the elbow and won't let it fold. So it binds. You lose a lot of binding affinity because folding over gives you more. So it binds maybe poorly, but it binds in a different conformation, and that no longer binds the DNA binding domain, and you don't get cancer growth. Best guess, we still don't have a crystal structure, so I can't tell you for sure. But nonetheless, all we had to do was to put something rigid there, and we got hits. Chemistry. OK, this is for the two people in the audience that know some chemistry. <laughs> we, the compounds are easy to make. So if you want to make this compound, we want to vary this piece and vary this piece. And we do it in a very quick way. We do something called a Strecker reaction, or you can do another pseudo Strecker. This you buy from Aldrich, a chemical company, one step to that. You mix these two together, lone pair attacks carbonyl, nitrogen lone pair attacks nitrile to generate this. We don't even isolate, we hydrolyze. So in two and a half steps, we can make all of the derivatives we need. And some real chemistry, so monobach, do a Strecker to generate A. This reaction, as I said before, is quantitative. You mix A and B together. The yield isn't, isn't good, but it doesn't matter anymore. When you're a synthetic chemist, that matters. But when you're a medicinal chemist, you don't care. So that's wonderful. <laughs> and then you hydrolyze to give this compound. And we can do other chemistry. And so even though that yield was bad, when you work on it, you can get up to 70-ish you know, percent yield. So, so we started making lots of different compounds. And I told the postdoc working on this that we needed to have some sort of nomenclature system. And I was going to say M-O for Mike and Samadhi and Mike and Uke. He said, no, boss, I got it. We're going to call them R-D. I said, R-D, why? He says, rationally designed. <laughs> <laughs> now, we did have a screening series, the SC series. So this was the rationally designed series. Anyway, we just called them R-D. So one of our first big hits was seven. And then 37 is the one we took forward the, the fastest. So I won't show many slides like these. They're, they're boring as hell. But this is what you have to do to show what's happening with your compound. We're looking at two different things. PSA level, so growth of cancer is higher. Luciferase, higher the number, the worse the cancer. And as you go down, you're adding more and more and more of the drug you're testing. We always add bicolutamide, which is the active one. This is hormone-sensitive cells, so bicolutamide is active. And in the first few compounds, none of them were particularly good. Over here, though, essentially every one of the compounds from 6 to 10 were at least as active or more active than bicolutamide. And that's something that was selling at that time about a billion dollars a year. So we've made 10 compounds, and we've got compounds that at least by activity look as good as the, the standard out there. Uh, but we want to look, so in hormone sensitive, I wanted to show 37. So 37 is clearly better than bicolutamide. Now, bicolutamide is coming off patent, so no one is going to go excited about this. But nonetheless, you know, in 37 compounds, we have a compound that's significantly better than bicolutamide. But this is in hormone sensitive. Bicolutamide works. And now this is the key, though. We put it in hormone refractory cells, the uh, LANCAP AR expressed cells. And look at that. Ain't that beautiful, man? We just pegged that baby. Here's nice dose response curve and luciferase. And when we do the mitochondrial stain, we're down. Oh, god damn it. Look at that. We, <laughs> we came up there. That's bad, because that looks like at higher dose, it's an agonist. We're starting to grow the cancer at higher doses. That we definitely don't want, because you want to be able to dose as much as possible. But nonetheless, compared to bicolutamide, which is an agonist, in these cells, we're doing very well. So this led to a long weekend, sleepless weekend, until we did in charcoal strip serum the uh, LANCAP AR cells. And now we can see bicolutamide and the, uh, the uh, agonist, or strong agonist. Look at that, man. We're just pegging that baby. So that's fabulous. That means that we're just knocking down this cancer great. But this will never be a drug. There's so many. Activity has never killed a drug. It's always PK and tox, and I'll show you why this one died. But the first thing to notice is that we have a drug, but of course, it's a hormone receptor antagonist, and we're a bag of hormones. So we have to make sure we're not hitting all of the other hormones that we have. So we looked at glucocorticoid. We have the positive control. We don't do anything. We looked at thyroid beta. We don't do anything. We looked at uh, estrogen. We don't hit estrogen receptor. We put it into breast cancer cells. We don't touch them. Normal fibroblasts. So it seems to be relatively selective. We hope we wouldn't get much uh, non-selective toxicity. Various people ask me, how did you and Sawyers get so far 
at UCLA with this drug. You, you made a, a, a huge push. How did you do that? And I, Pat answered two reasons. One, we have an animal facility, so we can put it into mice very quickly and see what's going on. Second, Charles Sawyer's printed his own money. So whenever we needed another 50 mice, just go buy them. I don't care what they call just go buy them. And so we constantly were putting into mice. So here is uh, the Landcap AR, so the hormone re refractory vehicle and biclutamid, the cancer grows. Seven and 37 was always slightly better than seven, which is why we chose it. Dose response curve, the more you give, the more you knock it down. That's great. And this is good, but you know, you, you really want a straight line. We should be cytostatic. We shouldn't be cytotoxic. But maybe we'd be lucky and we could actually start killing the cancer. But so this is, you know, straight across. It would be nice if we had a way of making that better. But part of the problem is this molecule is a brick. It dissolves in nothing. And it's really hard to make formulations so you can put it into animals. And so what we wanted to do was to make something more polar. Yeah, and I just show that. So seven has a log P of four. Uh, 37, much higher, biclutamate under three. We'd like to get down to three if we could. So we want something that's more hydrophilic. So we started with hydroxymethyl aniline, and we could make the hydroxymethyl compound. We could do oxidation. We could add Grignard's. We could do vitic. We could do chemistry to make compounds that were more polar, and that was good. And I'll show only one more of these slides. Just to show this compound 131, that turned out to be a really active compound, the most active compound we've ever tested here at UCLA. We made some others and sent them off to a company. But at UCLA, it was the most active, better than 37, better than anything else. But it won't be a drug either, because it falls apart too easily in metabolism. And in fact, what we found out through the work of a, hard post, uh, a hardworking postdoc is that this ring is too electron rich. And so we're sucking electrons, the, the, the uh, SIP enzymes pull electrons out of that ring, and you oxidize that ring. So what we did was to take the amide, that unit is called an amide, and put it directly on the ring rather than having a chain, and that pulls a lot of electron density out. And that was a really good compound. And then we did something called the medicinal chemist's best friend, a fluorine atom, and we put a fluoro atom at that position. And that compound, we're now up to 162, this compound, RD162. The amide is directly attached, the so fluoro is there. And even though its activity isn't as good, I'll show you the PK, and it's fabulous. It's pharmacokinetics. It, it's, it's a drug. The other compounds are just not drugs. They fall apart too quickly. So let me skip that. Here's the key experiment. There are actually two experiments. Let's look at the right-hand panel first. This is the PK after IV dosing. The little blue line you can hardly see is 37. Its half-life is probably a minute. The yellow line is 131. Its half-life is probably five minutes. So couldn't possibly be drugs. And this magenta line is 160. Ain't that beautiful, man? Its half-life is, I don't know, about 10 hours, 9 hours. Once a day dosing, that's a fabulous drug. Biclutamid is worthless, but it's got a very good half-life. It sticks around a lot. And this is a second way of looking at it. We look at the steady state concentration after 14 days of dosing at 10 mg per kg. You can't measure 37 under these conditions. You can barely measure 131. And there's 162, man, 10 micromolar. That's plenty enough to have the effect you want to have in cells. Same as bicolutamid, but remember, it's seven or nine times more, eight, not eight, nine times more active, and it's active against the disease this compound isn't active against, namely the hormone refractory disease. So this compound, now a new compound, we have to look at it. We put it back into animals again. So vehicle, bicolutamid, it grows. Look at that. Now, it's maybe a little hard to see, but that, that's actually going down. I'll show you one later where it's much more obvious. We're killing the cells. We're killing the tumor. Our mechanism doesn't allow that. Something weird is going on. We wanted to publish in Science. Science wouldn't accept it until we figured out what the hell was happening here. And what's happening is the, the AR is cytosolic. It binds testosterone in the cytosol, translocates into the nucleus, dimerizes, recruits coactivators, co-repressors, sends messages to grow cancer. We bind, our compound binds to the AR in the cytosol, but it inhibits, it binds in a conformation that inhibits translocation into the nucleus. The compound never gets into the nucleus. Those cells are no longer competent for growth. They go into apoptosis. 
So we are killing the cells by a mechanism that we didn't know. So I've given this talk lots of places, and biologists always come up and say, oh, I was really smart to target that translocation enzyme. It's like, smart, shit, we had no idea what we were doing, man. <laughs> lucky, lucky. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, now, this is the greed slide. You should have one greed slide. And that is, this is the hormone-sensitive model. So we already know that 162 is good against the later disease. It's at least as good as biclutamid at the higher doses. So that means once this is approved, it could probably be used as first-line treatment. You wouldn't have to wait until you got to the castration resistance. So, so uh, the compound is actually a slightly different structure. I should point that out. This has a cyclic ring, cyclobutane. Uh, Medivation, the company we licensed it to, wanted a compound with dimethyl. We made that. We called it 162 prime because it was so similar. They called it Medivation 3100. It should have been Medivation 1, but 3100 sounded better. So, so they took Medivation 3100 forward. It's a different compound now, so they did their own test where you look at the growth of tumor. So vehicle and bicolutamid, it grows one mg per kg at static, but at 10 and 50 mg per kg. Now, they, nobody in the audience can't see that's going down, right? So we've, we've knocked away in 28 days, the cancer has gone down 75%. So, so this apoptotic event is really happening. Oh, I should show one other thing. We wanted to do tox, and obviously in a company they did big, heavy tox, but before you do that, Quite often, you can get an idea of the toxicity of a drug just by measuring the weight, by weighing the animals. If the animals are losing weight, it's probably because they're not feeling good, they're not eating, they're vomiting, whatever. So if the animals don't lose weight, you have at least a good idea that it may not be toxic. So we did that study, and biclutamid vehicle, one mg per kg, they're, they're static, so that's good. But at 10 and 50 mg per kg, they're getting fat. They, you know, I used to call them fat and happy, but they've all been castrated, so at least they're fat. <laughs> and if the question is, what's going on? So I talked about this at a uh, company, and Dave Webb, the head of research at Celgene down in San Diego, said, well, Mike, that clearly says that you're hitting the AR. I said, okay, I'll bite. Why does that clearly say I'm hitting the AR? He says, well, it's, it's the eunuch effect. I said, the eunuch effect? What the hell are you talking about? He says, well, how many Skinny eunuchs, do you know? I said, I don't know any eunuchs, man. Skinny, fat, or otherwise. What the hell? Well, it turns out that the AR is also expressed in muscle cells, and the AR has to bind testosterone so that muscle cells operate properly and turn the food you eat from fat into muscle. If you can't do that, as you eat food, it just goes to fat. Eunuchs, of course, have been castrated, so when they eat food, it just goes to fat because they have no testosterone to bind. He says you're clearly binding to the AR in muscle cells, and that's why the mice are getting fat. When we did the phase one clinical trial, the men on average gained five to 10 pounds on the drug. So you can either be skinny and dead or fat and alive, one or the other. <laughs> and so this became a drug called they gained, they gained muscle. They gained muscle. I don't know if they gain muscle, they gain fat, that's for sure, but we didn't measure the muscle mass. But anyway, so this is the drug, it's called enzalutamid or Xtandi. Uh, it was almost five years ago now, it was approved for post-chemo and uh, three years ago for pre-chemo. There's Charles again. And this is the postdoc, Samadhi and Dong Wan that did the work on this. Uh, I wanna point out one thing that was going on at the same time, while we were still doing this work, we still worried about making a compound that was more polar, that would be easier to formulate. And we noticed in crystal structures there were a lot of water molecules in this spot on the structure. So we wanted to do two things. One, make something more polar. Two, maybe pick up some hydrogen bond interactions. And three, we were worried about patent coverage. I showed you the very first compound we started with. We've only changed this ring, and we've done a lot on it. We saw, saw some non-obvious things. But there was no guarantee we'd be able to, to defend the patents. So we wanted to do something where we made this a heterocyclic ring. And we did that. We put nitrogen at this position. We went back to a cyclobutane. And that compound was first called A52 in my labs. We founded a company called Aragon, and they named it 509. Again, it should have been Aragon 1 or Aragon 2, but 509 sounded better. Uh, and uh, we finished a phase two clinical trial with it, and then J&J uh, &J bought Aragon and bought this molecule, and it's now in its fourth year of a phase three clinical trial for 
much earlier, non-metastatic disease. We should find out something by the end of this year. Why is this important? Well, it's not really. If, if Xtandi works well, you don't have to worry about it. But Xtandi is still relatively nonpolar, so it crosses the blood-brain barrier fairly easily. And it turns out it's a GABA agonist, which means it can cause strokes and tremors. And in fact, in the phase one trial, two of the men had strokes. These are very sick old gentlemen, so they may have had strokes anyway. But we were worried about that. So metivation doses at 160 mg a day. This compound, because it's more polar, doesn't cross blood-brain barrier. And it seems to localize in the tumor for some reason. We're not sure why. But you can dose three times higher. So we can go up to 500 mg a day. And so that means you can knock down the cancer much faster. So, OK, so this compound is moving on. We'll see what happens. I've got 10 more minutes at least. I want to switch to a second project. I said Xtandi and others. If Mike hadn't taken so much time, I'd be able to talk about more. But. And I want to talk about work with this guy, Rich Petrus, who is still with us, is sitting in the audience here. So Rich is a clinical oncologist at UCLA, and we have about four joint projects together. And I'll talk about only one, and that's the metformin project that we've started together. Many of you know of metformin, a very common drug, one of the most prescribed drugs in the world for type 2 diabetes. And uh, we've actually formed a company called Enlibrium. I'll show you that. Uh, so metformin is a compound that was derived from a compound that's in this plant, French lilac. French lilac is also called goat rue or professor weed. <laughs> that makes me think of some dude in Colorado, you know. <laughs> so anyway. It's an oral drug for diabetes type 2 for polycystic ovary. It was first found to lower blood sugars in the 20s, first clinical trials in the 50s. It was approved in Europe in the 70s and in the US in the 90s. And about 10 or 11 years ago now, a Scottish epidemiologist did what epidemiologists do. She looked at patients with type 2 diabetes, some of whom were on metformin, some of whom weren't. She looked at you know, liver samples, blood, uh, kidney function, et cetera. And she found accidentally that there was a 30% lower incidence of breast cancer in women on metformin than those not on metformin. Until then, no one, I think, knew that metformin had anti-proliferative effects. Well, right now, there are 170 clinical trials ongoing in the US with metformin. Name a cancer drug you like, add metformin to it, and see if you get a better effect. And so, but we're chemists, so we can change the structure of metformin. And so that's what we decided to do. Oh, yeah, and what did we decide to look at? Well, we're looking at a number of different diseases, but the first one we went after was triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative means it doesn't have estrogen receptor alpha dependence, progesterone receptor dependence, and no HER2 overexpression. So there's no uh, targeted therapy like Herceptin. It only occurs in about 15% of patients, but it's almost half of the deaths, mostly in young women, African-American women. And it has a poor prognosis. Quite often it is, responds initially to chemo, but then after that it metastasizes, so it's, it's a bad disease. Uh, maybe I'll skip that. So we, we're still not sure of how metformin works. It clearly may work through the insulin-like growth factor pathway with AKT, ERK, or RISC, because all of those hit the TSC1 and 2. We believe its main effect is probably via energy stress, uh, LKB1. It activates AMPK, and that's known to turn off mTOR. So it's clearly hitting mTOR C1 is what we're doing here. OK, not too much of this. Owen Whitty said if I showed more than two slides, he'd shoot me. So well, sorry, Owen. Be careful. Chemistry slides, right? Anyway, you can make symmetrical ones, the same thing on each side fairly easily. You can make unsymmetrical ones, different things on each side fairly easily. You can make ones with NH2 left behind fairly easily. Whoops. And we made, oh, that was bad. Uh, click. And we made. Uh, let me go back one mic. And here we made compounds that had never been made before. So none of these were ever known where we have an alkyl group there. Anyway, we made, we're up to about 36 compounds in my lab, of uh, all analogs of metformin, none of which had been made before. So we patented this entire group. And as I say, we founded a company called Enlibrium, UCLA licensed the um, the uh, IP to them, and I have stock in that. 
And here's some activity data. So this is just normal breast cancer cell lines, so not triple negative. The blue bar at the top, the diamond, that's metformin. <laughs> this is what they get excited about. That doesn't look extremely active to me, right? You gotta give a hell of a lot before you see anything. We have some dogs too. We have some compounds that are no good, but most of ours are much better than metformin. Uh, here we're showing two compounds, OO2, at two different doses, uh, and the white bar is just human mammary endothelial cells. We don't touch those. We knock the tumor down, the MCF7. The, and here now is the first uh, uh, triple negative, MD Anderson, MB231. Again, metformin doesn't do much. We knock, knock it down very fast. I won't show all of these. Here's one dose response curve, metformin at the top. You've got to give a lot before you see any effect. We see a very large effect very early on. Maybe I'll skip that. So this is the one that I think got the company founded. Uh, Rich and his team takes a tumor at 50 cubic millimeters and control the tumor grows. This is a triple negative breast cancer xenograph. Uh, with metformin, it grows. It grows more slowly. But with O2 and O5, we knock that baby down, and it goes down to essentially zero. And I'll show a slide in a minute. We, we stopped treatment at 28 days, but we didn't sacrifice the mice until later. And the thing that's great is even after stopping treatment, it stayed at zero so that the tumor did not come back. And that's very unusual to have something that knocks it down. It tells you you're probably putting it into apoptosis. Uh, no weight loss in the animals. They seem to be fine. So what you can say is that we have selected analogs. In the company now, we're well over 100 compounds, and we're looking at using it first in a combination therapy, probably with an IO inhibitor like Abdevo or Keytruda, because those work but don't work in many cases. We're hoping we can get a better response if we add metformin to those. And we're looking at it in other cases as well. So we'll see. This is exciting. The, uh, <laughs> Jim Watson, the guy of Watson and Crick Nobel Prize winner, came to campus about two years ago. And he didn't give a seminar. He gave an interview because he doesn't talk anymore. He's an elderly gent. And he said, I want to meet with Mike Chung and talk about his research. It's like, Jim Watson even knows I, my name? Jesus, what the hell? It turns out he is Mr. Metformin. He thinks metformin is going to cure all the world of cancer. So he invited Rich and Demetrios. We went to the office and we showed him all of our data on metformin as an anti-cancer agent. He takes several grams a day. And I said, Jesus, Jim, that's a lot. I mean, is, are, there, are there any side effects? And he said, other than the raging diarrhea, nothing very much. So <laughs> more information than you need to know. Anyway, I think our drugs you'll take at a much lower level. We're actually going to test them now for diabetes to see if they would work in diabetics and without the side effects, whether we have the same GI effects or not, I don't know. One last story, I've still got time. And this story is due to this little woman. This is Jing Wong, who's sitting in the back there. So Jing is in pharmacology here, and she and I have a joint project, and we've also formed a company. And we're looking at life-extending small molecules, small molecules that give life extension, smiles, we call them. Uh, and the first one we've published on in a Nature paper is alpha-ketoglutarate. But we've now come up with lots and lots of analogs that look even better than alpha-ketoglutarate. But I want to show you at least some of the data. And as I say, we, we founded a company, Long Life Rx. And I'm on the board of directors in the SAB, and I'm also the chemistry consultant. And uh, one of the, the chemists who makes these compounds is in the audience, also Yan Peng. So this is what got us excited um, when we tested the SMILE compound, small molecules, to increase life expectancy. The control, uh, the lifespan of the mice, whatever it is. You add resveratrol, and it's longer, but it's about 10% longer. And some of you have maybe heard of that, resveratrol. There was a company formed from uh, resveratrol, and it was bought for 720 million bucks, and it never worked. It never worked in humans. And our SMILE, SMILE-1, alpha-ketoglutarate, is 50 to 70% life extension. So it's much, much better than resveratrol. But you know, these numbers are numbers. What's really neat is to see. So we did test in mice, and I should explain it first. So we did uh, six male and six female mice treated and untreated. 
The six male mice treated, you couldn't notice any differences. They looked the same, everything was okay. The six male mice, oh yeah, I should point out, sorry. We bought the oldest mice you can buy. 20 months, 22 months, I don't know, 22 months old. So we don't want to put it in a baby mouse because then you got to wait three years to see if anything happens. So you get an old mouse and you put it in the old mouse and see what happens. So we did it, okay. Six male, six uh, female. Six male treated, uh, no change. They live fine, everything okay. Six males untreated, five died. Now that's a hell of an endpoint, right? So one, only one survived. On the female side, all six females in both groups lived, but the females in the treated group had beautiful skin and beautiful, con <laughs> beautiful complexions, whereas the ones in the untreated got wrinkles and they, they got gray skin and they started losing their, look how beautiful that little thing is. <laughs> And here, here is the one untreated. Look at that, it's awful, they're losing its hair. And the one treated is just so beautiful, it's just love. I've had four women on campus tell me they're ready to be in the clinical trial when we're ready <laughs> to start. I'm re I, actually, I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I'm actually 106, I've been just taking these pills. From... Anyway, we are making more and more compounds and finding more activities. We have it now in mice and cats. We'll see whether, sorry, in dogs and cats. We'll see whether it works in them. It looks extremely good. We'll see what happens down the road. Alpha KG you can buy today if you go to you know, GNC. You can buy it. It's mixed with three times as much arginine and weight builders use it to build up muscle. So whether it'll help their lifespan or not, I don't know. Anyway, that's it. These are the folks that did the work. Uh, Yan Peng is the one who did that last project. Uh, Emmeline did some of the work on the metformins. Uh, this is what the group looks like, at least a somewhat recent picture. But I want to show you one picture. We had a big party in November when I won some award here on campus. And I invited everybody who wanted to come to come. And damn, they all came. And I had to pay for their dinner. This was. <laughs> anyway, I have them to thank for all their hard work, and you to thank for your attention. Thank you very much.